Christian tradition tells us that the Roman army crucified Jesus in the first century AD, then went on to persecute Christians for the next 300 years. But is it possible that the religion of Jesus was actually spread by the very same people who nailed him to the cross? This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich, from deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land. Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Back in the first century AD, the Roman Imperial Army occupied Judea and was known as the most brutal military force the world had ever seen. Made up of 30 legions, each with approximately 6,000 men, the army was paid to put down anyone who defied Roman occupation. According to the Christian Gospels, Jesus of Nazareth did just that. Branded as a heretic by the Jewish authorities and prosecuted as an anti-Roman rebel by the Roman governor, he was publicly executed by crucifixion in the year 30 AD, forcing his followers to worship in secret for fear of persecution at the hands of the Roman army. And yet, just outside the ancient city of Jericho, there is evidence that the same Roman army that oppressed Christians may have been secretly worshiping Jesus Less than three kilometers from where the Roman army was garrisoned in the year 70 AD, there is a cave that seems to have been used as a church as early as the first century. Simca has come here with the man who discovered the cave, archeologist Yuval Peleg. The Roman military was around here, right? הצבא הרומי מגיע בשנת 68 בקיץ במסגרת הדיכוי של המרד הגדול, הוא מגיע מהצפון, מגיע ליריחו. Right, right over here, right? Like... שני קילומטר, שלושה קילומטר yeah. בערך, ומחכה שם לקראת העלייה לכיוון ירושלים. פלג believes that the cave contains important archaeological information that may date to the time of the Roman occupation. Simka wants to go down and take a closer look. But the cave is known to harbor a potentially fatal disease called cave fever, which is carried by ticks that live in the rocks. So before descending into it, both Simka and Yuval have to protect themselves. But you know what? This is a great natural church. <laughs> it's like the Notre Dame Cathedral of the Dead Sea area. As Simca goes deeper, it becomes apparent that this cave was once used as a church. Inside the cave's belly, Yuval Peleg shows Simca the image of a cross carved into stone. Based on its design, it appears to be one of the earliest. You know what that is? That's a fish. The image of the fish is one of the first Christian symbols and was used as a secret handshake amongst early Christian believers. Is it possible that this was a secret church? This is, this is like an altar. You've got two crosses, a candle over here in the middle. But who were the people worshiping here? The answer may be provided by the symbol found next to the cross. The Roman sun god, Saul Invictus. The sun is a very important symbol in the Roman army, for example, Apollo, Sol Invictus. Romans worship the sun as the supreme god. But here it is with a vertical line dividing it into two. Could this solar disk 
be how the first Roman Christians tried to integrate the Christian idea of the Father and the Son into the Roman belief in the Son. So is it possible that this cave was a secret church for Roman soldiers from the nearby camp? Simca is now shown another symbol that may answer that question, a symbol that looks remarkably like a Roman military standard known as the Aquila. A banner topped by an eagle, its wings spread wide in the shape of an upside-down triangle. I think it's an amazing thing. In a place where you have purposeful crosses, you also have something purposeful that looks like a standard, some kind of flag with a cross in the middle. Like it flows down. It could be even cloth or something. We have a puzzle. We have a sun, crosses, some kind of symbol. Here in this hole in the ground in the middle of the desert, there are symbols that if properly decoded, may tell us how Christianity left the Holy Land and spread across the entire globe. First clue, fish. Which tells us that this is an early Christian place. Second clue, crosses. Which tells us that this isn't a single monk making one cross, this is a congregation. And the fact that it's underground tells us that this congregation is worshiping in secret. Now, since we're in Israel and all of Jesus' earliest followers were Jewish, you'd expect to find Jewish symbols in there. But you don't. Instead, what you find is the Roman sun god. And what looks like a Roman military standard. So is it possible that instead of suppressing Christianity and oppressing Christianity, some early Roman soldiers were actually spreading the faith? Before 2,000 years of history can be overturned based on scratches of a fish and a Roman military standard, Simca will have to find more evidence. So he now heads to Megiddo, called Armageddon in the Christian Bible. It's here, right next to what is now a maximum security prison, that archaeologist Yotam Tefer has found a compelling connection between the Roman army and the world's first Christians. In the second century, the Sixth Affairata Legion came here between Tel Megiddo, where we're standing now, and Megiddo prison, in the big field over there. So the Sixth Affairata Legion was camped right there, the Roman yeah. military. Yeah. They're basically occupying Judea. They control the, the north part of, of the country. It was during Tefer's excavation of the camp that inmates from the prison made their own amazing discovery while digging the foundations of a new cell block. What they found were the ruins of a Jewish village that bordered on the Roman camp that Tefer was excavating outside the prison. And there, right where the village and the camp met on the Roman military side, they found a mosaic containing images of fish. At first, they believed the fish were simply decorations but as excavations continued, they found a definite link to Christianity. The first inscription, uh, it was uh, dedicated to Jesus Christ. Then we found another two inscriptions. The last one, talking about the Roman army officer, centurion, that give the money for the flow. So, so this mosaic, there's an inscription dedicating dedic it. Dedicated by a Roman officer. It was confirmed the mosaic belonged to a house church that was built by a Roman centurion. It was positioned on the border between the Jewish village and the Roman camp. Conclusive evidence that rather than oppressing the first Christians, at least some Roman soldiers were offering them shelter, a place where both Roman soldiers and Jewish villagers could worship Jesus together. But were they practicing Christianity as we know it today? Just like the sun symbol found in the cave near Jericho, the centurion's dedication may hint at a pagan sensibility. 
the mosaic says, dedicated to the God, Jesus Christ. But the New Testament never refers to Jesus as a God, suggesting that the Romans who worshiped here thought of Jesus as one of many gods, rather than part of the one true God. To their amazement, right next to the fish, Tefer's team also discovered remnants of a stone table, leading him to believe that the type of worship that was going on here was already highly ritualized. Do you think this table is really a precursor to an altar? Yeah, later on it became the, an altar, yeah. To share a communal meal. And but this is huge, taking communion, eating together, Jews and Gentiles, and you found we, this right at the edge between Romans and Jews. Yeah, Romans and Jews, they living together. Now this is like 100 years before Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. This is why it's so important, because if you put everything together, it's evidence of Christian religion in the Roman army. But was this Christianization only happening in the Holy Land? Or could it be that just as in Jericho and Megiddo, secret Christians in the Roman army were spreading the faith to Roman forts throughout the empire? To answer this, Simca's investigation leads him to the largest Roman military base in the ancient Near East, the stronghold of Dura Europis. The conventional wisdom is that the world's first Christians were Jews and that they were persecuted by the Roman army. To escape, they fled north to modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. But we've seen evidence that as early as the second century, some Roman soldiers were Christianized. So is it possible that the world's first Christians went north not because the Roman army was persecuting them, but because they were sheltering them? not because they were fleeing from the Roman army, but rather because they were following the Roman legions northward. To find the answer, Simca has followed the trail of the Roman army here to the Syrian desert, to a city the Romans occupied in the second century. This stronghold had been buried under desert sands for some 1,600 years. Then, in 1920, a soldier digging a trench accidentally discovered it. When archaeologists began excavating, they soon realized it was the long-lost city of Dura Europis. Because of politics, it's impossible to travel from Israel to Syria. So Simca must ask his friend, archaeologist Dino Politis, to investigate these Roman ruins for signs of Christian worship. Ségolène de Pontbriand has been helping to unearth the city's remains for the past two years. We call Dura the Pompeii of the desert, yeah. which is very incredible to have all this building in the same place. Despite the common belief that Christians weren't worshiping openly in the first centuries for fear of Roman persecution, archeologists here uncovered evidence to the contrary. Not just a house church hidden in a soldier's home, but the world's oldest Christian church. Here in Dura, what's, what's the best evidence that we have Christians? You are going to see the most important, which is the Christian building. This big door is the entrance for the, the main room. I think it's the oldest we have in the world. When archaeologists found the church, they also discovered the world's oldest Christian frescoes. However, they have since been sent to Yale University. The frescoes are proof that Christians weren't just getting by at Jury Europus. They were flourishing here. In one of the frescoes, there is an early symbol of Christianity. There is a good shepherd just over here. You can see the sky, also the shepherd here, and is holding a sheep. Early on, the good shepherd became a symbol of Jesus, borrowed from the god Attis, worshipped in the Roman army. This is the first proof for Christian art. It's so, very important. When first discovered, this corner contained a baptismal font, proof that the people who worshiped here were open about their Christianity and were even baptizing new converts. 
Finding this Christian church isn't enough to prove that Roman soldiers were taking up the faith here, but it does tell us that Christians were being tolerated. There are Christians obviously living and painting beautifully their, their walls yeah. when Christianity is supposed to be illegal, but here there's no problem? There is no problem. Does all this demonstrate that Roman soldiers were converting to Christianity? Unlike the cave near Jericho, where we found Roman military symbols next to crosses, this church has no explicit Roman army symbols. So if Roman soldiers weren't worshiping here, where did they worship? Just down the street from the church, excavations have unearthed a temple devoted to the goddess Artemis. We are in the temple of Artemis, dated from the first century AD. So Roman pagan period. Yeah. Artemis was a fertility deity. She was the most popular goddess of the pagan world. Her cult was centered in Ephesus, modern Turkey. Here in Dura Europus, her temple was found right next to the Roman commander's house, known as the Praetorium. You can see um, this is a meeting room with some stairs. You can have a yes. seat. Yes, we can see. I and can see inscriptions too. In Greek. Yes. This is the name of the person who are sitting here. Strangely, none of these inscriptions refer to the goddess Artemis. But right above a stone seat that was inscribed with one worshiper's name, archaeologists found a cryptic symbol painted on the wall. The symbol is called the Satyr Square, or Magic Box. Not only does it predate the Christian church down the street, it might just hold a secret Christian message. They have found uh, four Satyr Square, actually. Yeah. This is in this very temple. It was on a plaster. Just like, like that. This is a Roman inscription. And it could be like a code for the Christian. A code. It's a, for sure a soldier inscriptions. Is it possible that Ségolène de Pombriand is right? Could this be a secret Christian code that was used by Roman soldiers? The Satyr Square is made up of five Latin words. Rotus, Opera, Tenet, Arepo, and Seder. But the square is also a palindrome, which means the same words can be read forwards and backwards, top to bottom. Always the same. So Rotus read backwards becomes Seder and opera read backwards is a repo. But then, hinged on the letter N, the word tenet remains the same. This appears strikingly similar to the cross found in the cave at Jericho. In the church at Dura, people worship Christianity openly, but in the army, where it was illegal, they may have needed the square to communicate their secret faith. Perhaps the square is a code within a code. To find out, we'll need to decipher the square. Dino now travels to the museum in Damascus. Rumor has it that right after they were discovered, three of the four squares were put into storage here. You are uh, responsible for the classical yes. section of the museum here. Also. Behind the museum's main displays, the curator takes Dino to the back storage rooms, where sure enough, there's Christian artifacts from Jura Europus, which haven't been examined for almost a century. Nobody's seen them. No. So these were wall plaster yes. taken from Dura. Yes. Dino immediately sees an image that looks like a Roman military sign. But instead of containing a vertical line, like the one Simca found at the cave near Jericho, this one contains a full cross. Does this once again illustrate how the first Roman Christians blended Christian imagery with their own pagan beliefs? Something here, something here. Suddenly, Dino sees a striking figure. 
a pictograph that looks like Jesus, arms spread wide in what scholars call the Orante position, a symbol of piety. Here, there is a sun clearly visible behind Jesus' head, perhaps the oldest depiction of Jesus ever found, an image that would come to dominate Christian art for millennia. And right next to this image is an armored horse, evidence of a Roman military presence. Unfortunately, nowhere in the museum's artifacts can Dino find the satyr squares that he had come here to investigate. We have nothing like this here. No. Do you know the last time these were seen? Have you ever seen this? No. no. At Euro Europa, we've seen evidence of the earliest Christian church, a place where they were baptizing people and gaining converts. But what about evidence of Christians in the Roman army? Well, they did find there four Sator squares. Is it possible that as Roman emperors began to persecute Christians, the newly minted Christians in the Roman army adopted the square as their secret symbol? Is it possible that the army that had crucified Jesus was now spreading Christianity in his name? Simca is searching for evidence that the same Roman army that persecuted Christians was actually spreading its teachings behind the backs of its anti-Christian emperors. So far, his investigation has turned up images that seem to be fusing Christian ideas with Roman sun worship, all found in military camps throughout the Near East. He has also found an ancient symbol called the Sator Square. Does this Latin palindrome contain a hidden code that was used by secret Christians in the Roman army? The answer may be found here in the ancient ruins of Pompeii. Once a center of Roman culture, it was destroyed in the year 79 AD, when Mount Vesuvius erupted, showering Pompeii with fire and ash. Buried for almost 2,000 years under six meters of pumice, Pompeii is the perfect portrait of Roman life, frozen in time, just 49 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. In the ruins, archaeologists uncovered the remains of an ancient training facility for Roman soldiers. What suggests that this is a military place? We have a couple of graffiti on the columns here that do suggest that there were soldiers here. We're in what's been called a palestra or a campus. This could have been like the campus martius in Rome where the military could go and practice. Surprisingly, in the ancient graffiti that was etched into one of these columns, archaeologists discovered the oldest Seder square ever found. The square itself no longer exists, but there's photographic evidence of the exact spot where it was carved. That's the exact spot. It's, it is right here. <laughs> it's as though we're looking at it. To get to the hidden layers of the square, Simca asks Professor Benefil to explain the plain meaning of the words. People have suggested that you could translate it this way. Sator, the sower. Arepo is not a Latin word, so it's been suggested that that's just a name. Tenet holds opera, work. Rotas, the wheels. Arepo, the sower, holds the wheels in work. And it's thought that there could be a sense of, you know, you must work hard, reap what you sow, all these different things. It doesn't make a fabulous sentence, but there's not an obvious meaning, and so. What's your gut feel? What's going on with this box? I think that this was a game that anyone could play when you're relaxing or waiting in the shade on a hot summer day, um, and that's maybe why it got written up here. So was the Sator Square nothing more than a game? A meaningless distraction for Roman soldiers with a lot of time on their hands. I'm not convinced. If it was a game, what were the rules? And how much fun could it be playing with a sentence that basically tells you to work hard? I think when it comes to the Sator Square, there's a lot more than meets the eye. But to prove it, I'll need a second opinion. And who better than an expert on ancient games? Simca now travels to the British Museum in London, which houses the largest collection of Roman artifacts in the world. 
It's here that he meets with ancient games expert Irving Finkel. The Romans liked to carve their war games in public places, on pavements and on stone. And sometimes the points of the game, instead of being just with dots or something, were actually laid out with letters which, read together, made sense. And then you encounter the Sartor opera. You think to yourself, oh, this is some kind of five by five game. But I'm fairly sure that it's nothing to do with that whatsoever. And it has to be separated and regarded as an altogether different category. Let, let me see if I understand it. You're saying, given what you know about games, this is not a game. I'm certain it's not a game, yes. Because the kind of place that it's found, coupled with the amount of labor it costs to carve it on stone, which is not a slight matter, means that it had more significance than that. And since the primary significance is so unclear, I should think the secondary underneath significance is the real one. You think it has meaning? It certainly has meaning, because you don't find lots of Latin inscriptions which are meaningless. Dr. Finkel has confirmed Simca's original suspicions. The Seder Square is definitely not an ancient Roman game. But does it contain a hidden Christian meaning? In an attempt to decipher the square, scholars considered whether the surface meaning of the words were a diversion. So they scrambled the letters to see which Latin phrases they could build. What they came up with ranged from the political, the one in power is at fault, to the demonic, Satan, cruel in all your works. But most were simply absurd. He terrifies the rutabagas, leaving most researchers to believe that the square was nothing more than a collection of random words chosen only for their ability to fit the design. To find out how random these five words really are, Simca has called on the help of computer scientist and medical research professor Michael Brudno, who uses mathematical formulas to determine the randomness of human DNA sequences. Simca has asked him to apply the same techniques to see whether the square's letters conceal a secret code. You're looking for things which happen by chance uh, very often and trying to tease apart, is there a hope of this being non-random? Professor Brudno assembles a database of all the five-letter words in the Latin language that can be read both forwards and backwards to see how many five-word squares can be built. The results are astonishing. So from these, we built 50,000 squares. So, 50,000 squares. So 50,000 square. squares, that's a lot of squares. It's right now generating all 50,000 squares. Of the 50,000 word squares that the computer generated, only the Sater Square's debatable message of holds the wheels in work appears to have any metaphorical value whatsoever. So what does this tell you as a kind of a pattern finder? These squares are hard to build. With 21st century technology, it took us a couple of weeks to get to sort through all of them. The person who found these put in some time into this. So it seems unlikely that the Seder Square was just a random invention. It must have had some kind of meaning. What do you say? I think the person came in with an intuition that these are the letters which I want. Because if he chose pretty much any other letters, the person wouldn't have succeeded in building the square. So the Sator Square was not a Roman game after all. It seems to have had a hidden meaning built into it from the outset. But did that meaning have anything to do with being a secret Christian in the Roman army? To find that out, I'm gonna have to go to the other end of the empire, to the forts of Hadrian's Wall. If I can find the Sator Square there, then maybe I can prove that this is the cryptic symbol behind the spread of Christianity. Simca believes that the Roman army that nailed Jesus to the cross also spread Christianity to the ends of the Roman Empire. It happened as a result of the sophisticated network of roads the Roman army built to flex its muscles over the people it ruled. The roads didn't just move soldiers, but also ideas, one of which was Christianity. So far, Simca has found evidence of Christianity among Roman soldiers serving in the Holy Land 
and nearby Syria. He's even found a mysterious symbol called the Seder Square that may contain a secret Christian message. But is there any evidence that Roman soldiers serving in the area of the Holy Land made it to the farthest reaches of the empire and brought Christianity with them? In Manchester, they found military discharge diplomas belonging to Roman soldiers from the second century AD. What have we got here? These are very helpful because they're a snapshot in time of the garrison of a province. Does the picture tell you of movement? The name of the place where he came from doesn't survive complete. It would suggest he came from Heliopolis in Syria. That's very say. close to Jesus' country. Yeah. We're talking 133, 132. Jesus was crucified in 33, which means that they could have come into contact with the very earliest Christians. It is quite possible. So soldiers from the Holy Land made it to England. But were they Christians? It seems at least some of them were, because there's evidence that Roman soldiers sent for and married Christian women. This is the tombstone of a lady called Aurelia Iyer. She herself came from Salonas, which is in modern-day Croatia, and that is one of the earliest Christian cities in mainland Europe. Um, so that suggests that she may be a Christian, and the idea is then supported by the fact that she lived without blemish. It's an epithet which tends to be used in Christian contexts. So the information pulled together suggests that this is a Christian. The tombstone shows us that not only was she a Christian, but she traveled across the Roman Empire to get married to a Roman soldier. It seems soldiers from the Holy Land traveled to Roman Britain, and some of them were sending for and marrying Christian women. But if the Roman army had a secret population of Christians, is there evidence of that in a military context? Simca now travels north to Hadrian's Wall built in the second century to defend against Celtic tribes from the north. Vindolanda was one of the military forts along the wall. It's here in the soldiers' barracks that archeologists have uncovered the foundations of a Christian church, a Christian tombstone, crosses, and a so far undeciphered symbol carved into a portable altar. This sun cross reminds us of the ones we found at the cave outside Jericho and at Dura Europus. But it has evolved even further. It's now more like an abstract portrait of the crucifixion. Further evidence that Roman soldiers were fusing both pagan and Christian ideas into one and that they were carrying those ideas with them to the farthest outposts of the Roman Empire. The most famous Christian in the Roman army is the first English martyr, St. Alban. St. Alban is said in the accounts to have been martyred by Caesar, who caused this soldier to be arrested for being a Christian, uh, refusing to carry out pagan ceremonies, and has him executed. This story demonstrates why it was important for Christians in the Roman army to keep their faith a secret and share a symbol that no one could decode. I think that the square is likely to be Christian. Christians would be able to use this as a secret uh, way of communicating with each other. To find that symbol, Simca now travels back to the city of Manchester. Once a western outpost of the Roman Empire, it's here that archaeologists uncovered the fragment of a Seder square that just might be the oldest Christian artifact ever discovered on British soil. So was this a big surprise? You could say that, yes. <laughs> it's, it's one of those um, wonder moments for an archaeologist when you come across a find like this. You've recreated that around there, eh? We have enough there to enable us to be very confident in reconstruction. This is a very standard piece of Roman pottery called an amphora, and these were big storage jars which were used for olive oil, fish sauce, wine. This kind of clay jug was used to store wine, and the fact that it has the Seder Square engraved right on it strongly suggests it had a ceremonial purpose. Maybe it was used during communion. 
And the interesting thing with this find, it came from a rubbish pit between two buildings. Simkin now finds out that the rubbish pit was located next to a Roman military fort. There would have been auxiliary soldiers bringing their religions with them, one of which would have been Christianity. So why not for a soldier to put this piece of graffiti on the emperor for a subverted religion that he totally believed in? So you just look at it, it's yep. some letters, but it could preserve somebody taking, risking their lives for their faith. I think it's remarkable that he's got such a small fragment, but there's such a big story. In the centuries that followed, squares just like this one found their way to Roman forts in Portugal, France, and Hungary. Wherever the Seder Square went, Christianity soon followed. But can the secret message of the Seder Square finally be decoded? Simca has found the Seder Square in a Roman military context at the farthest outposts of the Roman Empire in both Britain and Syria. He's convinced the square holds the missing clue of how Christianity spread to the Western world. But he still doesn't know what the square really means. To break the code, he's going back to where the earliest Seder Square was found, here in Pompeii. Back before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii was the Roman version of Sodom and Gomorrah. The streets were lined with brothels like this one. The walls covered with body frescoes depicting sexual pleasures that anyone could experience for a price. But not everyone in Pompeii was drunk on sex and paganism. Some people believed that Pompeii was going to be punished in the manner of the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah. Total annihilation. This piece of ancient graffiti invokes a curse against Pompeii, revealing a distinctly Christian point of view. What do we make of it? You always want to start with what's the clearest, and this is a kerem, C-H-E-R-E-M, is a transliteration of a Hebrew word. And it's often in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So it's always used for divine retributions, just blotting out. And then poinium, it's written in Latin, it's an attempt to represent a Greek word, poine, a blow or a strike. Ponium cherem it means to strike with utter destruction. Exactly. And these are the five pointed stars, Solomonic, as if to bring power to a kind of a curse, maybe. The cherem curse was found in the doorway to this house. It seems to have acted as an amulet, warding off immoral activity. But who were the people who lived here? Inside, archaeologists found a fresco that depicts the owners, a man named Paco Procolo and his wife. From the fresco, we learn that Paco wasn't Italian. He probably came from the Middle East. In his hands, he holds Roman citizenship, given to soldiers after 25 years of service. But is there any evidence that Paco Procolo was a Christian? From the Pompeian record, we learn that at one point, he purchased a bakery. He then discovered that his building was adorned with pagan sexual imagery, which Paquo felt compelled to cover up, evidenced by the remains of white plaster. Then inside, above the bakery's main furnace, archeologists uncovered a cross. Strong evidence that this former Roman soldier was now practicing Christianity openly. Simca now wants to see if any other artifacts were found at Patwo's house. Suddenly, he is presented with an inscription whose existence he was not aware of. Not a photo, not a fragment. It is the world's oldest surviving Sater Square. This is not the same house. Ah, the same house, he said. But they're saying that this Sator Square was found in the same house as the Cherem inscription. This square is dated no later than 79 AD, just 49 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. And right above the square, we also find the image of the fish, inscribed in the same style as the one found at the cave near Jericho. 
think we found where the magic box came from. Clearly, the square was no game. Here it was found in a doorway alongside biblical symbols and curses. We even know the name of the former soldier who inscribed it, Paco Procolo. But we still don't know what it means. So Simca pays one final visit to Dr. Irving Finkel. The likelihood is that it's an early Christian device in which they wanted to write the words Pater Noster in such a way that it wasn't obvious that that's what it was. And you think it has Christian meaning? Anybody who takes the effort to write an inscription has a meaning behind it. And meaning is sometimes transparent and sometimes obscure and sometimes both at once. Dr. Finkel believes that the square refers to the phrase Pater Noster. As it turns out, when you reorder the square's 25 letters in the shape of a cross, using the square's only M as your axis, you can create the Latin phrase Pater Noster, which is translated as Our Father, the first two words of the most important Christian prayer in the Gospels. Arranging the words in this way leaves four letters outstanding, two O's and two A's, which seems to represent Jesus' famous lines from the book of Revelations. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But there may be one other Christian message encoded in the square. It involves a repo, which is the only word that has no meaning in Latin. What if it is a mix of Greek and Hebrew, just like the curse found in Paco's doorway? In Greek, there is one word that sounds a lot like a repo. That word is Aleppo, which sounds like a Greek version of the Hebrew A, once again forming the Alpha and Omega. Using the word Aleppo would have ruined the palindrome, so the similar-sounding Arepo was used instead. If this is right, the Seder Square's five words read, the Alpha and Omega hold the wheels in work. In other words, decoded, the secret message that Roman soldiers were spreading is, Jesus makes God's work possible. Found with Roman and early Christian symbols, the Seder Square hides an image of the cross, a secret prayer, and a concealed message, all pointing towards a Christian meaning. Found at Roman military camps across the empire, it also tells us that at a time when Christianity was an illegal movement, Roman soldiers weren't just adopting Christianity, they were adapting its symbols for their own needs thereby shaping Christian ideas and icons for future generations of worshipers. The common perception has been that the Roman army persecuted Christians for the first 300 years after the crucifixion, and that Christianity was being spread by apostles and martyrs. But compelling new evidence suggests that this is not the whole story. Finding the Sator Square all over the Roman military world tells us at least three things. First, that Roman soldiers were risking their lives by worshiping in secret. Second, that their idea of a sun god was influencing their idea of Jesus. Third, that the religion of love was being spread not only by people fleeing the Roman army, but by people serving it.